Okay. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I think um, if we um, should kick off. Um, my name is uh, Neil McHugh. Um, I'm a rheumatologist uh, from Bath. Uh, this is the second time I've given this talk this afternoon, so I should have it word perfect by now. Um, at least uh, the previous one was a dress rehearsal. So um, I come, how many of you have been to Bath? Oh, okay, I'm equally uh, pleased in the previous session, quite a few of you have. Um, you'll appreciate it, it's a, it's a lovely city. Um, it has its historical roots even from Roman times, uh, and you may have visited uh, in the, uh, the baths here. Um, so uh, people came to take the waters and to uh, generally have a good time. And um, then it led to the formation of a hospital because there were so many people coming to take the waters that they thought they could cash in and build a hospital. And... Uh, um, invest in some spa therapy. Um, and I'm just going to touch upon a little bit of a history of a hospital that may be of interest to you. This is the coat of arms of the hospital here, which is uh, full of imagery. I just really want to concentrate on this chap here, who was Prince Bladud, and there's a legend of Prince Bladud, who was banished from his kingdom by his father because he had this awful... Uh, skin condition, which was leprosy. So he came to Bath, and he was a swineherd and looked after pigs. And the pigs caught leprosy from him. But they had the sense to wallow in the mud around Bath, and he noticed that they were cured from his leprosy. So Bladed was no fool. He wallowed in the mud himself, and he was cured. And he went back and inherited his kingdom. That's the legend of Bladod. Um, and so, as I've mentioned, patients came to Bath for the healing powers of the waters. And if you um, uh, go into the hospital, there's a famous oil painting on the stairwell, uh, which depicts really one of the first ever combined clinics uh, between a physician, um, uh, Dr. Oliver and William Pierce, a surgeon. And of note, the three patients who you see here who are depic depicted um, are a patient on the left um, who uh, has a cane and has typical hand deformities of rheumatoid arthritis. This chap here um, has a uh, wrist drop, a neuropathy, which most likely related to lead neuropathy as it was accustomed to um, sweeten the cider in, uh, by lining the barrels with lead. And so patients, uh, or at least the population, um, had an increased incidence of lead poisoning and neuropathy. And in fact, if you went into the waters, this led to a diuresis and getting rid of the lead. So in fact, immersion therapy or spa therapy was a good treatment for lead poisoning. And this young child here has a rash, which uh, you can speculate um, uh, may uh, uh, be the first case, or at least a case of juvenile a juvenile dermatomyositis. So that's a little bit of history. Um, and um, there are various treatments used in those days, or at least even in the 20th century. Uh, um, I reassure you we don't use some of these techniques today, um, but spa therapy was uh, quite common. Uh, the delivery of water in all sorts of manners, uh, hot baths, and this gentleman soaked in a... Uh, in a, in a in a hot bath. Um, the application of mud, mud therapy, um, was um, uh, very common. Um, these hoists uh, delivering patients in somewhat precarious positions into the, into the king's bath and bath. And of course, it was very important to uh, be fashionable uh, when you were having your uh, electronic sort of voltage therapy in the four cell Schnee bath. Moving on back to the topic for today, and I'm going to cover uh, what are antibodies and what are autoantibodies and how they relate uh, to myositis. And antibodies are part of the immune system. They're an important part of the immune system of warding off infection, all sorts of noxious external stimuli, uh, particularly you know, bacteria, virus, fungi, and so forth. They form part of our immune system, our natural immune system. 
And there are two forms of the immune system, if you like. There's the more immediate, sort of immediate, innate immune response, whereby certain cells um, immediately recognize foreign material, particularly infection, and deliver a series of chemicals and enzymes to get rid of those particles. And this is the innate or immediate immune response. You also have another what's called adaptive immune system that takes longer to kick into action and relies on a different series of cells called B cells and T cells. The T cells are the clever cells in the background that regulate the immune system. And the B cells are the effector cells that deliver antibodies. Uh, and literally there are thousands of antibodies that are very specific in what they recognize. And they all recognize a bacteria and then deliver it to these guys, the uh, effector cells, in order to eliminate um, those bacteria. So antibodies are an important uh, form of the immune system that kick in to, to um, encounter uh, uh, infection. Now, if you, um, and I'm sure quite frequently uh, you have blood tests, and uh, within the blood, um, if you look under a film, there are these various cells in the blood. Most commonly numerous are these red cells that carry hemoglobin and deliver oxygen to the body system. These smaller particles are platelets that are important for clotting if you cut yourself. And then, importantly, a group with the term white cells, of which there are different forms, uh, that are important in terms of um, uh, warding off uh, infection uh, and so forth. You can break down these cells uh, um, further uh, and uh, into, I can't actually see the slide very well from here, I have to say. Um, into um, the effector white cells uh, uh, called neutrophils or macrophages. Uh, and then I think up here, correct me if I'm wrong because I can't see it from here, there are these T cells and B cells that are part of the adaptive immune system uh, that are important um, that kick in later. And under a microscope, again, uh, you'll see uh, these red cells. This is a neutrophil, which is part of a more immediate sort of um, uh, defense system. Uh, macrophages, that are the um, gob gobblers, if you like, of foreign material, uh, and get rid of it and eliminate it. And uh, uh, lymphocytes, which are slightly smaller, darker cells, uh, of which there are B cells and T cells. And here again, uh, you've got these, uh, uh, your macrophages that are the gobbler cells, uh, and then the B cells that produce antibodies, recognize bacteria, and are important for latching on to those foreign particles and eliminating it. And these T cells, of which there are different types, that help the B cells do their job. So B cells, you have B cells and T cells are part of the lymphocytes, they're called lymphocytes, B cells and T cell lymphocytes. Uh, T lymphocytes have more a regulatory function. Uh, they recognize particles and deliver signals to other cells that have other functions to eliminate um, foreign material. Whereas B cells, if you like, are more the soldier cells. They take signals from T cells. They need help from T cells whereby you call these T cells T helper cells um, that are important for getting the B cells to manufacture antibodies. And this is a B, the B cells make uh, immunoglobulin. And this is a cartoon of an immunoglobulin here on the right. And it has a, um, a what's called a heavy chain and light chain, these light chains at the top. And within the light chains, 
there are very um, a, a diverse array of different configurations that are very specific for recognizing uh, very discrete um, molecules, and that gives diversity and specificity to the immune system. So you've got literally thousands and thousands of different types of immunoglobulin that have different recognition systems for recognizing very specific uh, molecules. And that's really the function of antibodies or immunoglobulin. And you can see here the B cell will, um, uh, with help from a T cell, uh, will manufacture these antibodies that latch on to foreign substances and um, help tag it to other cells to, in order to eliminate it. And this here again is another cartoon. Um, Again, I can't see this very well from here, but there are B cells that um, recognize your antigen, and then with T cell help, the B cells, in fact, they either uh, recognize your foreign particle and become what's called memory cells, and these memory cells are stored away for when you're re-exposed to that antigen at a future time. So the immune system can kick in much more quickly than it did on the first instance. And this is the basis of vaccination, and that you've got primed immune cells that immediately recognize foreign particles. But the B cells also become plasma cells, and these are the soldiers, the effector cells that release antibodies. Bodies and, and latch on uh, to foreign particles and with the help of these gobblers, uh, the macrophages, are able to eliminate uh, foreign material. So that's, that's a description of antibodies. So what are autoantibodies? Uh, okay, so Again, this is the structure of an antibody uh, that I mentioned before with this uh, heavy chain and the light chain domain. Incidentally, these antibodies can be manufactured and are very convenient in terms of therapeutic strategies because if you manufacture them so that they recognize particles or molecules such as TNF, that's the basis for biological therapy and such as anti-TNF or indeed um, rituximab, uh, which is an antibody that will recognize certain uh, B cells. However, in some cases, this all goes uh, slightly awry, and the antibodies don't recognize that just for foreign particles uh, that they are probably, uh, properly uh, supposed to, but recognize self-antigens, in this case, coil DNA. And these antibodies are anti-DNA antibodies, one of the first antibodies to be recognized in association with an autoimmune condition. And this was first described as an LE cell, which is found in the bone marrow of patients with lupus, uh, reported by Hargreaves in 1948. So the first test, a uh, diagnostic test for an antibody associated with lupus. Uh, and this was the LE cell uh, um, here, which is the mechanism was these antibodies recognizing DNA. So in summary, Autoantibodies are immunoglobulin produced by B cells, uh, which instead of attaching to foreign antigens, uh, for instance bacteria, um, are, are recognized self-constituents or autoantigens. Most autoantibodies are not thought uh, to be, have a functional role in producing damage themselves, rather they're just really biomarkers of some immune response. Although it is possible still that some of these antibodies themselves may have a functional role, but by and large they're thought really to be just biomarkers. The important point is that there are very close associations between particular autoantibodies and particular forms of disease, and indeed within those disease, certain clinical phenotypes. And it is even possible that within those diseases, an autoantibody profile can actually inform uh, um, the physician of different sort of treatments that may be particular for that particular clinical pattern. So I'm just going to really touch a little bit on 
the methods for measuring these antibodies as it's not a straightforward subject. Um, and it's important to realize that these tests are not always perfect, um, but they can, with the right interpretation, be important for informing management. Now, you may have heard of an ANA test, an anti-nuclear test. An anti-nuclear refers to an anti-nuclear antibody. And the usual screening test for an anti-nuclear antibody is a test called an indirect immunofluorescence test. Now, this is a screening test, okay? In most cases, it doesn't identify a specific antibody. But it's, if it's positive, other tests need to be used in order to actually positively identify what antibody is responsible for the positive ANA test. Nonetheless, an ANA is an important screening test, and if you use certain cells that can give some information on the antigen that's being recognized, most commonly in a HEP2 cell line is conveniently used as your cell line, but other cell substrates can also be used for this particular test. Um, most often, though, another test is needed, is necessary, to detect the antibody, and there's a different forms of tests, um, the most common of which you would have heard of called an ELISA test, um, which the particular antigen is uh, placed in these wells and uh, can lead to um, identification of the antibody that's responsible for your ANA test. And there are more sophisticated tests, um, which are more in the research province, that can go a step further and give more precise information on the particular family of proteins that are identified um, uh, by the ANA. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a moment. I thought I'd walk through with you, because this principle applies to all the assays that are important for identifying antibodies. I'm, just, I'm, I'm afraid this might be a little technical, um, but I think um, it's uh, important to realize how these autoantibodies are detected. So, in the first place, you need an antigen source, okay? Um, something that represents all those self-constituents um, that an, an, an immune system can uh, recognize, these self-antigens. And this is usually uh, in the form of a, of a single cell, a HEP2 cell, um, that contains antigens, or these proteins, um, that, are, that form part of your body and can cause an autoimmune reaction. Then you need your source of antibody, and this comes from yourselves, from your patients. They may have a particular antibody um, that you uh, get from uh, spinning down a blood sample and getting the serum uh, from that sample. You need a second antibody that's a commercial antibody that latches on to your own antibody in order to detect it. And often this in an, in an, an immunofluorescent test is tagged with a conjugate that lights up a, under a fluorescent microscope. And when you look under a microscope and you see a green fluorescence pattern that tells you that you've got a positive ANA. So just to go through this, this is a HEP2 cell. This is, this is, this is your cell library that has the antigens that you, you, that you want to know whether they're uh, recognized by your antibody. Um, in most cases, these are, uh, this represents some antigens found in scleroderma, but you note that JO1 here is representative of um, myositis. You label that with the serum from your patient and the patient's uh, um, serum recognizes the antigen. You, you then add a secondary conjugate that tags onto your human antibody, and then you get this different array of patterns that show a positive ANA pattern that in some cases can be specific for a particular antibody, although in most cases you need to go ahead with another technique. As in JO1 here, seen here, that gives a relatively weak pattern on an ANA and so may get missed in some more conventional screening strategies. I mentioned the technique of an enzyme of ELISA. This is the same principle. I beg your pardon, I'll just go back. Um, whereby, if you're interested, for instance, in JO1, the JO1, oh, blow, sorry, beg your pardon. The JO1, the JO1 antigen is put in a well, uh, and then you add your um, uh, serum that 
uh, that your patient's serum that detects the antigen. You put on a secondary uh, enzyme-tagged antibody. That lights up, and you can actually measure the levels of the antibody. Okay, I'm going to get less technical in a moment, so don't worry, don't fret. Um, and then there's some of these newer techniques that I think are more in the research province, but can give really much more specific information about, and more sensitive in some ways, for detecting these different um, antibodies. And this is a research slide that I'm going to, which our group have used to detect some novel antibodies that I'm not going to uh, um, go, go through in detail. You may well ask, what does all this mean? I'll try and put it into some more clinical context for you. So, to come back to autoimmune disease and why these antibodies are important in terms of informing clinical management. Well, there's a spectrum of autoimmune conditions, that some of which are listed on this slide, starting with scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, vasculitis, what we used to be called uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, Sjogren's, systemic lupus, and not the least, uh, uh, dermatomyositis, or the myositis spectrum of antibodies. Now, the important point is that all these conditions have very specific autoantibodies associated with them, different families of autoantibodies that are quite specific for these particular conditions and therefore are quite helpful in terms of the diagnosis. For instance, in scleroderma, there are a particular family of autoantibodies that are quite specific for scleroderma, um, so-called ACPA or anti-citrinated uh, peptides and rheumatoid arthritis much more specific actually than rheumatoid factor for rheumatoid arthritis. ANCA antibodies, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies associated with vasculitis. Uh, ROLA or SSA, SSB with, uh, uh, with Sjogren's shown here uh, that can overlap with lupus that has its own family of antibodies. And then again, dermatomyositis that has a um, more specific repertoire of myositis-specific antibodies that I'm going to describe in a little more detail. So, indeed, how do autoantibodies work in myositis? So, as you know, myositis covers a broad spectrum of different patterns. You know this, you probably suffer from a lot of these different manifestations, uh, from skin rashes, uh, characteristic skin rashes, uh, uh, perhaps Raynaud's phenomenon can affect children as well as adults, an important component uh, being interstitial lung disease, um, and sometimes complications um, such as calcinosis, and of course muscle disease itself. So really a diverse array of different patterns of disease. So, and here again are the different broadly classification of uh, idiopathic inflammatory myositis, uh, what we term polymyositis, although important components of this are something called the antisynthetase syndrome, and another condition, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, um, which forms a part of polymyositis. Dermatomyositis, uh, patients who may have very little in the way of muscle disease, uh, but mostly skin disease, but may go on and develop severe muscle disease, so-called CADM or clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. An important association of dermatomyositis with, uh, with cancer, uh, an increased risk of cancer in certain types of dermatomyositis. Of course, importantly, inclusion body myositis, part of the family of idiopathic inflammatory myositis. I've mentioned juvenile dermatomyositis, and then myositis sometimes associated with other connective tissue diseases such as lupus, scleroderma, and so forth. This is, can you advance? Thank you. And until recently, uh, these were the antibodies that one could detect in a relative minority of patients with myositis, probably no more than 30% or so, and this was up to about 10 years or so ago. And here, at that time, it was thought that antibodies were absent in these patients with cancer-associated myositis. The situation has changed a little bit, 
It's working intermittently, but I'll have that as backup. Thank you. Okay. And in recent years, um, there are a number of important antibodies that have been discovered that now increase our ability to identify a myositis-specific antibody in up to 60 to 70% of cases. Okay, there are still 30% or so of patients who you can't find an autoantibody, but we're working on that. And within time, I think we'll discover new systems that are actually important in terms of the clinical um, diagnosis. I should also mention these myositis-associated antibodies that are less specific for one condition, but often seen and often important because they identify patients with overlap conditions, uh, uh, with an association with overlap with other conditions, such as lupus and um, scleroderma. Now, myositis can affect children as well as adults. The pattern can be slightly different in children uh, than adults, although sometimes there are common manifestations. So it's not surprising, and I think I'm just going to show one or two slides to sh uh, sorry, excuse me. The, and this is the different distribution of antibodies um, in, in children versus um, adults. And I'll come back to this and make a little bit more sense of that. Um, we've been fortunate to study um, about 300 to 400 children with uh, juvenile dermatomyositis until quite recently, and there weren't many antibodies associated with um, JDM. Uh, these were the ones that were associated. Uh, but now we have three new antibodies, also found in adults, but are also quite prominent in children, TIF1, gamma, NXP2, and MDA5. And importantly, these antibodies identify different patterns in children, and I'll come on to the adults uh, in a moment. And so this is our collection of antibodies in children, what is known so far, and you'll see that these new three antibodies uh, make up, I beg your pardon, make up um, about a third of cases and so um, the recent development and discovery of new autoantibody systems has actually been an important clinical advance in our detection of juvenile myositis. And I'll just show you one, one of our publications last year to show an association between this antibody called anti-NXP2, found in about 15 to 20% of children, and it identifies those children who have this sometimes quite horrendous complication of calcinosis, irrespective of their age, the antibodies associated with calcinosis. And in fact, this association holds true in adults where calcinosis may be less frequent, but is also associated with the presence of anti-NXP2. Similarly, another antibody called anti-MDA5, uh, when we looked at children, it had the same associations as in adults um, with some association with the presence of interstitial lung disease. Also, these children had an increased incidence of skin ulceration um, and, and tended to have milder muscle disease. So just a brief summary, because I, I, I realize that mostly we are concerned today with adult myositis, but in juvenile myositis, um, these myositis antibodies are present in uh, about 60% of cases. They may be quite valuable in terms of a diagnosis. And um, the, some of these newer specificities uh, associate with important clinical subtypes. Also, the levels may actually, measuring, and this hold, holds true in adults as well, measuring the levels may actually also help in measuring disease activity. OK. So moving on to adult myositis and how these antibodies can help in terms of both diagnosing and then recognizing different patterns of disease in adults with myositis. And this is really quite a busy slide, but it's really a summary slide. I'm going to go into more detail in terms of some cases that I'll present that represent how these myositis-specific antibodies associate with different patterns of disease. You will know of the um, sorry. You will know of the antisynthetase syndrome, and I'll show you a case of the antisynthetase syndrome. The important antibody here being anti-JO1 that was recognised um, several years ago, 
but now there are a family of different anti-tRNA synthetase antibodies associated with this important syndrome, which makes up an important component of polymyositis. Whereas other specificities are more associated with skin disease, uh, such as um, anti-MI2, anti-SAE, which is a system um, our group discovered, um, and then certain associations with cancer that I'll come back to. So-called necrotizing uh, uh, myopathy, uh, which is associated, uh, uh, although not perfectly, with the presence of anti-SRP, uh, and also with this antibody uh, discovered with statins called anti-HMG-CoA reductase. And then importantly also, and more recently, in IBM, an antibody found in 30 to 40 percent of cases, anti-C1NA. Okay, so to make a little more sense of this, I'm going to show you a few cases that I think really give a little bit more real life uh, evidence of how these antibodies um, can be very helpful. And this is a case of uh, mine, a lady who presented uh, almost 10 years or so ago now, and she had really quite a um, classical history of an antisynthetase syndrome. She presented uh, with a history um, of, uh, of breathlessness, uh, followed six months later by some muscle weakness, um, had a history of raynodes, joint aches, and some puffy fingers. In other words, really a very common pattern of what we thought to be an antisynthetase syndrome. This is her CT scan showing presence of an interstitial pneumonitis. We treated her at the time quite aggressively uh, with IV cyclophosphamide and methylprednisolone. She is actually still under follow-up and, uh, and is doing relatively well on a combination of mycophenolate and prednisolone. Now, we looked for an antisynthetase syndrome in this case, and were surprised that we didn't find one, at least in the first instance. Um, but she did have um, a system that we discovered. These are some of the more conventional antisynthetase syndromes shown on this gel. But you'll see here she had these bands on this gel that we were able to purify by mass spec, and we identified another antisynthetase syndrome called antiphenylalanyl tRNA synthetase, quite a mouthful. So uh, Dr. Betteridge, um, who discovered this antibody, called it after herself and termed it anti -zo. So anti -zo antibody, which is a new um, autoantibody system. And a summary slide, really, of antisynthetase syndrome. Uh, we recognize that these patients, as well as myositis, are prone to interstitial lung disease. They may have arthritis, high incidence of Raynaud's, so-called mechanics hands, uh, seen here, this fissuring sort of rash on the radial aspects of the fingers, um, and a high incidence of fever. And in association with not only JO1, but these other antibodies, some of which are not um, commercially available, I'm afraid, but only really in a, in a research sense, but probably make up about 5% of cases of polymyositis if you total them up together. So the learning points from this case is that interstitial lung disease uh, may be a predominant, in fact, it may be the only manifestation of antisynthetase syndrome, particularly with these non jo one um, um, cases. So patients you may have experienced yourself of being under a lung physician um, um, not necessarily with any other manifestations of myositis, perhaps until later in the disease course. So these antibodies also can be missed um, because the ANA is not a perfect way of detecting them. Um, just on a management front, often it's important to get other disciplines involved, obviously in this case with your pulmonologist. And just by the by, that this case would not have fulfilled um, criteria, the old criteria for um, myositis, but the antibody was helpful in making that diagnosis. I'm going to show you another case, which I think is really um, uh, quite an interesting case. Uh, so again, again, my patient who's given me permission to show this. And this lady presented in 2002 with really what you would see was really quite a florid rash, a really quite severe rash. Um, and uh, the biopsy of this shown here showed some changes that could be consistent with either lupus or dermatomyositis. She was under the dermatologist at the time, was treated with prednisolone and hydroxychloroquine antimalarial. Well, 
Several months later, six months later, she developed really quite significant weakness. In fact, it became profound weakness, although she had relatively little rise in terms of her um, CK. MRI scan revealed really a lot of edema. This is a florid pattern of um, inflammation in the muscles on an MRI scan of her arm and a biopsy showed changes consistent uh, with an inflammatory myositis. And in her case, um, again, she didn't have an antibody we were aware of at the time, so we did uh, some a little research, and this is her antibody on this gel here. Again, bands that we didn't recognize as being um, unknown. We were able to mass spec them, and she had this antibody uh, called um, anti-SAE that we went on and discovered was present in about 8% of cases of dermatomyositis and is actually quite specific for this particular uh, pattern of disease. Um, so just to follow her course, as I mentioned, she became profoundly weak. We use a score, it's an in-house score we've used uh, called an MMDS score, which is a functional assessment of your muscle strength. And you score from naught, where literally you can't move or use any muscle, up to 33, which is normal. Well, this lady fell. Her MMDS score almost reached rock bottom. It scored about two. She couldn't lift her head off a pillow. Uh, we were really very concerned. She had all sorts of conventional treatments, hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, cyclosporin, azathioprine, pulse cyclophosphamide, IVIG. Whether she decided really just to spontaneously improve or not, as it happened, we did give her at the time a course of treatment with infliximab. Um, we would probably use rituxan these days, but at that time, infliximab with mycophenolate. The good news story is that whether it was that treatment or whether something else happened, at least she recovered extremely well. And in fact, if you follow this graph out to now, because I continue to see her, her MMDS score is now normal. CK levels are normal. We, did, we in fact, tapered her off all treatment um, last year, but she had a minor relapse, and now she's back on a low dose of mycophenolate. So really quite a good outcome in what was a really profoundly severe case and an association with a newly discovered autoantibody. Um, and this led us to, uh, uh, this is the a description of the case that we published um, uh, and as I mentioned, found in about 8% of our UK adult myositis population. So learning points from this case, uh, that um, it's an example of a case of clinically amyopathic uh, dermatomyositis who presented with skin disease and then went on to have severe muscle disease. The CK was not a very useful measure. In fact, if we just go back perhaps to that graph, you can see that her CK level, grumbling along here, was completely normal when she was profoundly weak. So although the CK levels can be helpful, in some cases they, can't, they don't necessarily reflect severity of the disease. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, a new antibody reported here, and she's eventually made a full recovery. Um, oh, and this is our larger series um, um, shown here. Okay. I'm going to show you another case. I've got a few more cases um, uh, which illustrate um, these different antibody specificities. Now, um, this is a chap who presented, uh, in fact, last year, uh, quite more recently, uh, with a fever to our, our general um, take. Um, he had a four-month history of fatigue. Oh, blow, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, and uh, uh, muscle aching and weakness. Um, and a really quite a significant anemia, although despite all efforts, the source of his anemia um, uh, uh, remained unknown. A high rise of inflammatory markers, he was really unwell, a uh, high rise of CRP and plasma viscosity. He had a normal myeloma screen, normal screen for infection. All investigations really uh, were coming back normal, normal CT scans, um, colonoscopy, um, so forth. MRI scan uh, showed a bit of uh, muscle atrophy. And um, we were asked to test his serum, and he had this antibody called anti-TIF1 gamma. Previous medical history, he suffered from type 2 diabetes, and of relevance, he had a renal cell carcinoma uh, in 2011, 
He was in fact taking part in a trial following nephrectomy, and he was thought to be in complete remission from his cancer. All these investigations um, had been normal. Nonetheless, we were very concerned. He carried this anti-TIF1 gamma antibody. We thought there was a high chance that he and may have had a recurrence of his tumor. Um, and indeed, as was the case, um, we did go on and uh, treat him um, in parallel to further investigations. Um, there was some uh, slight response to uh, treatment as listed here. But importantly, the PET scan uh, did show, um, uh, uh, lit up a uh, metastasis, uh, a recurrence of his tumor in the large bowel uh, with an associated lymph node. Now, it's not all a grim story because he had um, a, lapros uh, a laparoscopic surgery and then further resection of these uh, secondary deposits. There are only two of them here. And um, I saw him quite recently, and he's had a full remission. So, so far, so good. In fact, uh, this uh, uh, recurrence was detected quite early, um, alerted to the fact that he had this particular antibody, that, he, that uh, uh, there's a high risk of having a tumor recurrence. So there is an association of dermatomyositis with cancer. There are certain uh, forms of cancer that, that um, are, are slightly more common. And the presence of this antibody um, does make these patients um, more at risk. Um, although having the antibody itself, and there are more patients who have the antibody who don't have cancer uh, than the other way around. Um, and, and I guess the flip side of this is that if you're negative for the anti-TIF1 gamma antibody and have dermatomyositis, there's a much lower risk of actually having an associated cancer. So it works both ways. Sir, is that similar to the P155? Yes. Yes, I'll describe it a little on a different side. So the uh, TIF1 gamma is the same as the P155, P140 um, um, system. Um, they're synonymous. So the learning points from this case are uh, that um, uh, the presence of, uh, uh, I'll get this right uh, by the end of the talk, um, uh, uh, requires very careful screening uh, for any occult malignancy, but nonetheless there is potential for full recovery, even in this scenario, uh, with successful treatment of the, of the underlying malignancy. And to get on to the point that was just raised, uh, this is the antibody here, anti-TIF1 gamma, uh, recognizes P155, P140, this, P1, because this is the molecular weight of the antigen on a gel. This, this goes out at a weight of 155, this is 140 on a gel. Originally recognized by um, Irotagov's group and a Japanese group. Uh, the, these are the proteins that it's recognized. Um, it has an important role in uh, lots of different um, cellular pathways. It's found in adult myositis associated uh, with uh, in about 20% of adult cases of dermatomyositis. Interestingly also, it's found in about 20% of cases of JDM, where there's no association at all um, with, uh, uh, with cancer. And um, just some further data. Uh, this is very hot off the press data, if you like, from a series. This is our first... 1,616 cases, we've studied the serology in a big European myositis uh, registry. This is ongoing work, and these are just preliminary results to show that the presence of this um, antibody, um, and again, I have difficulty reading from here, so forgive me, um, that the association with uh, um, cancer ever um, is higher in patients who carry this antibody than not, and then a present in what we call cancer-associated myositis, in 20% of cases, this is a much, much lower frequency in those patients who don't have the antibody. So the message here, okay, is that there is an increased risk of cancer, but it's not that high, all right? There is a 20% chance of having cancer, at least in this European myositis cohort, if you have this particular um, antibody. I don't, what does, sorry? I, interstitial lung disease. So, um, again, is that a, a lower incidence of ILD if you have this antibody, uh, if you have this antibody, rather than if you don't? So, ILD. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, this is ongoing work, and we've got other information on other antibody specificities in this valuable European cohort. Um, 
uh, another case, really. Uh, this is another chap who presented uh, a few years ago now uh, um, at a relatively young um, age with a 10-year history of left leg pain, three months cramping in his calves, um, episodic sort of mild weakness, mild elevation of the CK, normal EMG, MRI scan showed some uptake in a gastrocnemius muscle that led to a, um, uh, to a muscle, an informed muscle biopsy that uh, showed classical changes of um, IBM. The relevance here is that uh, we did um, detect what was called at the time anti-MOOP44, which is a new antibody, also anti-C1NA, which is present in about 30 to 40 percent of cases of uh, IBM. Um, and we're, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about uh, the uh, significance of these antibodies um, in, in IBM. Uh, learning points is this, uh, here's the antibody, as I mentioned, found in 30 to 40 percent of patients with IBM. Although it's not completely specific, it can be found um, occasionally in patients also uh, with, uh, for instance, with Sjögren's and uh, less so in, in, in lupus. Um, but I'm sure it will prove to be a valuable diagnostic a marker. And why it was discovered was that the antigen itself is more enriched in muscle tissue, and muscle tissue was the source of antigen in some of those assays I uh, showed you earlier. So you have to have the right antigen in those sort of systems in order to actually detect um, these antibodies. Another case, if you'll bear with me. Um, uh, and this is just to illustrate another phenomenon, an important phenomenon. Uh, and this is a lady who presented uh, a couple of years ago uh, with um, a four-week history of progressive muscle weakness. Again, moderate weakness on her MMDS score. Uh, and she'd been on a statin for about four years, uh, quite a high CK, and um, her, I can't quite read, yes, um, and, and we did find this antibody to anti-HMG-CoA reductase. Um, she is actually, uh, following this, has actually done uh, quite well. Uh, we did treat her initially uh, while this information came back um, fairly aggressively, um, but um, she steadily improved and now has had a full recovery um, a, a couple of years out. Just to illustrate the point that statin-induced myositis may be associated with this antibody to HMG-CoA reductase. He may have had a talk from Andrew Mayman, his group discovered this antibody, and it's also found in cases who don't have statin exposure, so it's not a perfect um, um, association. Um, however, some of these cases, and even this case, had a full recovery, and the levels of this antibody may be helpful in monitoring um, the disease. Um, okay. I think, just move on. Yes, this is um, a summary slide. Uh, just got a couple of slides, and a couple of summary slides. So, these autoantibodies in myositis, they identify very distinct uh, subsets of, um, uh, of disease, uh, particularly clinical subsets. I haven't shown you the, the data, but they also probably give us closer um, um, ways of looking at genetic associations, because if you look at the genetic stratifying for antibodies, you'll find much tighter genetic associations. They also probably identify important environmental um, uh, triggers uh, for um, autoimmune myositis. You've, shown an, you've seen an example of um, statin-induced myositis associated with anti-HMG-CoA. Patients with anti-MI2 antibody, there's a high level of um, um, photosensitivity and possibly ultraviolet light plays an important part in triggering that form of myositis and so forth. So they may help uh, give insight into the causes of disease, um, and they have become um, a, a really um, are increasingly becoming an important uh, a part of a routine uh, diagnosis of these cases, possibly even predicting outcome, although that needs some um, um, future work, as indeed tailoring, personalizing treatment to particular autoantibody profiles. Now, I haven't shown you, but we've done some work ourselves showing that the actual levels of the antibodies may be associated with disease activity. So 
in addition to the routine test you send off, if you have, for instance, a LISA test that can actually measure the level of these antibodies, uh, they may actually inform treatment decisions in terms of tapering treatment or increasing treatment. Um, and so, but there's much more work to be done on that. So that was uh, almost my final slide. Um, uh, just really some acknowledgements uh, to members of my group, um, particularly Dr. Betteridge, who's done a lot of the work of adult myositis, Dr. Tansley, the juvenile cases, um, our collaborators in UK, it include Professor Cooper, Dr. Chinoy, Professor Wedderburn in particular. Uh, we have a really strong network of collaboration within Europe. Um, uh, the UMyonet co um, registry now has over 3,000 patients. We're able to do some of these studies now because we have both genetic material, um, serum that we can measure these antibodies, so we're getting a lot more information by pooling resources and doing registry studies that allow us um, to do much more powerful studies. And of course, thanks to all our patients, of course, who've taken part in our research very willingly, um, giving up um, their time, um, both not only in these type of biomarker studies, but also in clinical trials. So, and also, importantly, our funding organisations, of which um, um, there, are, there, are, there are many. Um, so I think that's my last slide, and I'm very happy to take any further questions. If you're already. <laughs> How long does it take to do the end? Oh, okay. Um, well, um, for ever since 1948, if you like, that's the first, you know, but it's, it's, it's advanced every, every year. In terms of myositis, um, the um, anti Joe one was um, first discovered, um, I would say, over 30 years ago, uh, 30 to 40 years ago. So, um, and then and other antibodies uh, like anti-SRP and that really for, for some time, for some considerable time. I think there's been an acceleration over the last five or 10 years. And some of these antibodies that I've mentioned here have only recently, um, you know, come to light. Some of, the, uh, some of them are also only available, unfortunately, just really in a research setting. And they haven't really spilled over to commercial assays, and that's always a bit of a tension, you know, a tension we would like, you know, to offer these tests, um, but they need to be properly accredited, properly approved, obviously through the usual sort of mechanisms. Um, so there are very few laboratories who can actually deliver that sort of expertise. But there's a lot of work in terms of now translating some of these um, new systems into commercially available sort of lab systems that, you know, that are open um, for anybody to use. So I was just diagnosed a year ago, and I don't know whether I was tested for TCP when I go back and check my records. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think there may be some profiles now that encompass some of these newer antigens, um, so that might be useful. Um, I was asked this question also in an earlier session, and my answer was that um, that, that might be interesting to know, um, but um, in terms of any investigation, you only use that investigation if it's going to you know, um, change or inform treatment. So although it may give you, you know, some more knowledge, um, unless it's going to be used in terms of informing treatment change, then um, you know, it's for interest rather than um, a source of changing your treatment. Yes, this lady number one. Yeah, um, oh. I can see how you know something to acknowledge this can help with diagnosis. Um, but you said like the autoantibody cells do not do damage to the body. Yeah. Um, is there studies going on with what that relationship is between the autoantibody and the mechanism? That yes. Yes, no, that's a very, very good question. Yes, and I didn't really have time to cover that so much. My own feeling, and I think a lot of the feeling, is that the antibodies really are just a, a, a by-process. You know, they're not, they're not the harbour of damage themselves. More interestingly, as though the proteins or antigens that they recognise often have very um, important roles in cellular sort of metabolism. So it's probably more the antigen than the antibody that's more specifically related to the disease mechanism. And we know, for instance, that some of these antigens are actually much, much more enriched in diseased tissue, uh, in muscle, 
certainly in uh, skin, uh, um, so Me Too, the TIF1 Gamma, um, others are sort of enriched and regenerating sort of muscles. So there's a lot of work going into how these antigens are really driving the immune system, and they're out of control, and they're really the, the source of driving an immune response. So more interest in terms of studying, I think, the antigen um, or rather than the antibody. Um, no, I think the, the, the antigen is probably more important in terms of discovery pathways, in terms of disease pathogenesis, whereas the antibody is more helpful in clinical utility in terms of the diagnosis, because they're an imprint or a biomarker of a desire, and they're much more easier to uh, measure, um, although uh, still not, 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 not easy. <laughs> yes. Uh, Oh, uh, no, no, it wouldn't. These antibodies are different. So the IVIG um, doesn't have any immediate effect on the presence or even indeed probably the level, although there are not enough studies to really answer that question. But you can still detect uh, the antibody regardless of a particular therapy. Um, sometimes they may diminish uh, with treatment, but they're usually still present, although at, at, at lower levels. But as far as I'm aware, IVIG shouldn't have any influence on their levels. There's a lady from the back. Yes, forgive me, I'm not sure whether that was a question asked in the morning session as, as, uh, as well, but uh, it's a very important question, yes. I think if, if the antibody is present and by the, by the technique of immunoprecipitation, then it's probably a very reliable test. Um, as some of the newer platforms for looking at these antibodies may be slightly less reliable and you sometimes can get false positive results, but the immunoprecipitation test is actually a very robust test. So to answer the question about um, repeating it, um, it's probably not necessary. Um, uh, in terms of the association, obviously, with cancer, that can actually obviously be very, you know, quite worrying. Um, but as I think I demonstrated, hopefully, on that data from a European study, um, although the risk has increased, it's still actually rel relatively small, but it does identify those patients in which it's important you know, to do a thorough screen. Um, so I ho hopefully that answers your question. Yes, indeed. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, a question over... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so there's some, a bit of a gray area sometimes between uh, fully myocytosis and asymptomatic myocytosis. Mm. There are some of the autoimmune antibodies that you can test that are more specific for asymptomatic myocytosis. I'm not talking about the related. Yes, yes. No, I think that's right. Um, polymyositis is a general term. Um, it's quite a useful clinical term. Um, describes myositis. Um, Whereas uh, immune, to give its full term, immune-mediated necrotizing uh, myopathy um, is, can be a worrying term because necrotizing is not a particularly <laughs> nice word, um, but it, it really refers to the histology, the muscle sort of histology. Now, um, anti-SRP, um, there is an association with that and the uh, that type of pathology, but that's not by all means a perfect sort of, you know, association. Certainly we have patients with anti-SRP who fall into the milder spectrum of uh, myopathy. I've had biopsies that show more inflammation rather than um, um, cell death or um, uh, necrotizing myopathy. Um, so I think it's, it's important um, that we've got more insight into the different sort of pathologies and muscles. 
but also remembering, and I um, have to be careful here, some of my colleagues may disagree, particularly those interested in muscle biopsy and histology, um, but muscle biopsy is just a really a, a sample of a single site, you know, and so you don't really, you know, there can be sampling errors, uh, and so um, I think you need a, 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 a other tests that uh, give a more reflective picture of what's happening in the entire body, are more useful than a single site muscle biopsy. Although the biopsy obviously is, it can be very helpful in terms of diagnosis. So I hope, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, if, if your question is whether um, MRI scan can inform the site of biopsy, um, that, that's correct. That, that can actually be very helpful, uh, particularly in cases where you don't have much more to go on or your usual tests might be negative. I would say, though, that if your serology is positive, there's less need, you know, to have a diagnose, uh, to have a biopsy because you've you've really got the diagnosis because these antibodies really are really quite um, specific. Um, so that would inform clinical decision more than having repeat biopsies. Yes. Oh, yes, MMDS. Now, I need to I read it all the time, and I keep forgetting what it stands for. Um, uh, manual Muscle Disfun Dysfunction Score, I think, Manual Myositis Dysfunction Score. We stole it, actually, from the pediatric um, uh, literature, um, which was a childhood um, uh, functional score. And we've used it, really, for over 25 years now. Um, it's um, a score where the patient does different um, 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 activities, such as raising their head from a pillow, stepping up and down from a, from a um, um, stool, um, lifting their arms for a certain amount of time, and so forth, scoring those activities from a naught to a three, and then it adds up to, to a total score of 33. And we just find it's very useful in terms of our physios use it routinely um, as quite a nice way of sort of tracking muscle strength. Obviously, there are different ways of doing testing testing muscle strength, uh, MMT tests and so forth. But um, it's just a very quick and handy test um, that, uh, that we found very useful. Yes. Not quite. So how do I justify? Oh, yes, I see. Oh, okay. Well, it's very much an age-related um, um, phenomenon, certainly in children, um, and there are several studies now to show that the anti-TIF1 gamma is associated in about 20% or so of cases of children. And it has certain sort of, they can have certain characteristics. And as far as we know, there's no association with cancer with children. However, as you grow older, however, it, 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 it may possibly be appointed to some sort of children are very resilient, aren't they? So it's, it's quite possible that those children may have had some sort of uh, cancer event or what we call oncogenic event from which they've recovered. And these antibodies are just really, you know, a, a marker of something that's happened. Um, um, but for all parts, we have no evidence to suggest that these, can these children get cancer or have cancer. But as you get older, you have more of these breakdown of your immune surveillance, and it takes probably less for an external trigger or a virus or whatever to cause something that leading to something that, that perpetuates a, you know, a, um, a, a leading to a malignancy. And that same event that does that probably generates this antibody. So as you grow older, the association of this anti-TIF1 gamma with cancer becomes much stronger. Um, so, um, so it's more so in the you know, quite elderly population that you get a much more stronger association of the anti-TIF1 gamma uh, with cancer. But at a younger age, it's virtually negligible. So it's much of an age-related phenomenon.
A higher risk in Oh, I see. But if you do, uh, if you do have your age-adjusted sort of against a normal population, and that population incidence of cancer, still the risk is higher in, in patients who have this antibody. So you need to do the right statistical sort of tests to account for the fact that cancer gets more common as you get older anyway. Yes, so, so you, you're quite right. You need to do the appropriate sort of adjustment for that. But when you do those adjustments, the risk is still there. Thank you. Yes. I think a lot of that work is going on, um, really, in more fundamental research. We, we do learn from basic science uh, some of these mechanisms uh, of results of viral infection, fungi infection. I think there's a whole breadth of science out there that does cover um, you know, your, uh, the topics you mention. It's really applying it to lessons to inform myositis that we more or less concentrate really on, on more of a translation, what we call the translational side. Um, so I'm not quite sure I can easily answer that question, but I think um, reassurance that some of this um, uh, um, research into more fundamental sort of mechanisms is really, you know, it, 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 there's a lot going on. It's, okay, so I don't think I've um, seen any other hands raised. So. Um, thank you for your perseverance and, um, and attendance.